All right. <clears throat> my, out of all my Swedish students, Olaf is by far the handsomest. And he asked me, what are the real world implications of voidness? Of course, Olaf is my only Swedish student, so that really, you know, slants the statistics in his favor. But anyway, let's, so let's answer that question. Let me quickly hit this. Okay. First, I'll tell you what the implications are not. Number one. Well, if everything's void, nothing really matters. That's a common myth. Dilgo Kensei what used to say, one of the teachers of the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet, used to say, yes, everything is dreamlike, but every night we dream and given a choice, and in, in our dreams, we have dreamlike actions with dreamlike results that can create dreamlike pleasure or dreamlike suffering. When we're in a dream, we would rather have a good dream than a bad dream. Number two, another fallacy about voidism is that it promotes nihilism. Well, if everything's void, then nothing really matters. That's not why we explore voidness. Why do we explore voidness? Voidness is just a very handy way of saying that which we just noticed is as non-graspable as the vast empty sky and a bright, beautiful, cloudless day. You see, we have a tendency to grab at things, things, beings, and phenomena, and phenomena with, with white knuckle intensity. And the sufferings we experience seem to be directly proportional to the intensity with which we grasp. Why, even in the 70s, there was a mediocre rock band who sang a song whose refrain was something along the lines of, hold on loosely. So, for instance, if we are in a relationship and we are consumed with terror that at any moment we could lose our partner, that neediness, that clinging could drive them away or if we add anger to the mix and we become jealous and possessive that will most assuredly drive them away but if we can realize viscerally that we really can't control our partner or the circumstances that could affect you or your partner if we can realize that from place of centeredness, then rather being, than being driven by fear or jealousy, we can just be more easygoing and appreciative for the present moment and all the good fortune that has befelled us, befallen us up to this point. When we read The Power of Now by Edgar, Eckhart Tolle, and if you haven't, please get yourself a copy of it. You can get it, you can order it on Amazon. You can read it on your phone with their free Kindle app. It's a wonderful book. I've been practicing meditation for numerous decades. I still find this book to be profoundly helpful. There is a myth that purported by intellectuals and pseudo-intellectuals that samsara is the state of failing to understand the ultimate nature of reality. That's a myth. We cannot think our way to nirvana, but we can feel our way there. How do we do that? By moving from a place, uh, from, a, a, from a focus of there, to a focus of here, by moving from a focus of then to a focus of now, and most importantly, by 
moving from a place of participating with our mind, you know, getting in the mud and wrestling with the pig, versus merely witnessing the mind. So for instance, if we feel rage, we do not have to justify, minimize, rationalize, or fatalize our rage. We don't need to castigate and mock and deride ourselves for feeling rage. We can simply notice the rage. And by noticing it as an impartial witness, we move it from the place of being the driver of the car of our life into merely being the passenger in the car of our life. Of course, I'm speaking figuratively. So when we recite the Heart Sutra, we talk about the voidness of the five aggregates or the five senses, five sense organs or the five sense perceptions or the five sense objects. Voidness is just a shorthand for saying as ungraspable, as a vast empty void of bright blue cloudless sky, but that's tough to say. How then, how do we realize the voidness of anything we notice? Simple. We notice our object of mindfulness during the in-breath. What then, what do we do during our out-breath? Physically relax as best we can. What's that? You say you have trouble relaxing? No problem. Our ability to relax during the out-breath is directly proportional to the depth and duration and quality of our in-breath. So at times when we feel emotionally stagnant, when we feel stuck, when we feel like we are just resisting life, Notice that on the in-breath as you take a deep, long breath. On the out-breath, relax your body even just a little bit. Do that for five minutes, 15 minutes, 60 minutes, and you'll feel like a million bucks. Combine that practice with brisk walking meditation, and you'll have a solution. To P, for PTSD. What? What's that? You said you'd love to walk around the block, but you're an amputee and you can't do that? No problem. The magic of walking meditation is found that it's a, a binaurally stimulates both sides of the hippocampus. If you can't walk, you can tap both sides of your collarbone, your clavicle. When uh, about two years ago, my tantric partner and I were in an accident in the car. And for the longest time, both of us exhibited signs of minor signs of PTSD when we were in traffic. To this day, when I'm in traffic and I start feeling myself getting tense, I take one hand off the steering wheel, I put it on my clavicle, and I start tapping either side of my clavicle. Not both, but either side, back and forth. That helps me to process whatever I'm feeling, or thinking, or recalling, or imagining. So, the real world application of voidness is this. Buddha talked about moving into the state of the deathless. If we are subject to death, then when life is over, we die like a light bulb going out. And if we associate and identify with the there and the then and try participating with the three ring circus that is our mind, we too will go out. But it has been, been proposed that if we habituate and identify ourselves 
with the here and the now and merely witness what goes on between our ears. Now we will experience fantastic freedom, increased creativity, resilience, and resourcefulness. And that momentum will carry us through the mystery of death. Now, do I know that to be 100% certain? Well, since I haven't died today, I really don't. But what a wonderful way to live. Free of distraction free of participation, free of resistance.